Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, welcome. <laughs> Welcome for this uh, new seminar from the Instituto de Astrofísica de Andalucía. Today, we will have the talk by Dr. Bahar Bidaram from the University of Granada. And she will talk about the effects of pre-processing of the stellar population content of early type dwarf uh, galaxies. So Dr. Bahar Bidaram, she got the, uh, her uh, bachelor in physics and masters in, in astronomy from Al, Al Sahra University in Tehran, Iran. Then in 2015, she went to the Astron Institute of Netherlands to work with uh, H1 observations for uh, ultra compact high velocity clouds as a summer internship. In 2016, she won the Spanish SolarNet grant for mobility of young researchers for her master project uh, on the magnetic fields on, of the sun. In 2017, she started the, her PhD in Heidelberg University as part of Sundial International Collaboration. During her, her PhD, she worked on the formation and evolution of uh, dwarf galaxy in, galaxies in clusters. She graduated in 2021, one year exactly one year now, and in September uh, to, uh, 2022, uh, she joined the Cavity Collaboration and started her postdoc in the University of Granada. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Bahar, for this talk. And the floor is yours. Thank you so much, first of all, for inviting me and also for the nice introduction. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome. So as you may now know, my name is Bahar Bidaran, and today I'm going to present you the work that we did during the last year. Results of this work have been published three months ago, and today I'm going to talk about it. It's mainly about the stellar population properties of early type dwarf galaxies, or as you like to call them, DEs. And in this talk, I will uh, review the stellar population, what we know about the stellar population content of DEs, I present you a sample of pre-processed DEs in Virgo cluster. This is the main sample I've been working on during my PhD. Then I present you the stellar population properties that we derived for this sample. And then through comparing these properties with other DEs of Virgo and Coma cluster, I interpret the results and we see if pre-processing would affect properties of present day cluster DEs or not. But in order to make sure we are all on the same page, a very brief introduction to DEs. So low mass galaxies, low mass early type dwarf galaxies, as the name suggests, they have low mass less than 10 to the 9.5, 10 to the 10, depending on the reference that you choose. Um, they are dominated by all the stellar population. The rate of star formation in these galaxies is low, if any. And if you like to know how do they look like, then I shall present you NGC 205, one of the most famous early type dwarf galaxies in the local group. This is satellite of Andromeda. And as you can see, they are dominated by red light, indicating that the stellar population in this type of galaxies is super old. Uh, but they do not look like as boring as they may seem here. Because in fact, uh, in the last decade, there have been studies over this type of galaxies. We now know that they, can, they have substructures, so you can find bars, spiral arms, nucleus, disks in this type of galaxies. And also the fact that they are one of the most abundant type of galaxies in the universe make them a great test bed to investigate evolution of galaxies uh, in different ways. Um, these type of galaxies have low mass meaning that they have shallow potential. Hence, they are susceptible to the environmental effects and environment can affect these proper, the properties of these galaxies. But also to review very briefly, what do I mean when I call environment? I shall present you this nice illustration by Irie Chang. She has beautifully summarized all the possible environmental effects that the galaxy may suffer, may experience inside a high density environment, clusters, galaxy groups, filaments. So you may be familiar with some of these uh, procedures that are happening inside the high density environments. 
Uh, for example, run pressure stripping is one of the most famous effects of environments that we know. This happens when a galaxy comes to the cluster because of the velocity that the galaxy has traveling inside the cluster's environment. The density, the high density of the environment inside the cluster, the gas component of the galaxy starts to be removed from it because gas is loosely bound to the gravitational potential of galaxies, particularly dwarfs with low mass. Uh, so that creates these beautiful tails of baryonic matter, or which is mainly gas, and created these galaxies that we call them jellyfish galaxies. So ram pressure stripping obviously affects the, con the gas content of galaxies, that can affect the star formation activity of the galaxy, that can affect partly kinematics of the galaxies, and also morphology in some extreme cases. Um, another environment process that is important are tidal interactions. So galaxies are not alone in clusters and groups. There are hundreds and thousands of galaxies there. So galaxies may merge together, may have flybys, may also experience tides from in nearby galaxies. And also inside the cluster, you always feel the gravitational potential of the cluster. So the tidal fields there are strong. Tidal interactions can affect kinematics, morphology, star formation activity of galaxies. And uh, also we can see some extreme cases as beautiful as here, the systems that they are merging together, some very complicated stuff going on there. And there are also other environmental processes that are here. We know that they all act on galaxies, but on different time scales. This is important. How long your galaxy is exposed to an environment is important. Of course, a galaxy that has been inside cluster for five giga years, six giga years is different than a galaxy that has just accreted to the cluster. This is something that we usually neglect because as observers, we cannot measure how much time a galaxy has been inside the cluster. So this is one of the problems that we are facing. The other problem is that, not problem, but this is nature, uh, galaxies do not come to clusters only individually. They come to clusters also as back gravitationally bound members of galaxy groups. So before coming to the present day host halo, which can be a cluster or a massive galaxy group, they may suffer, they may have suffered from the environmental effects. This is what we call pre-processing. And also in recent years, the studies also showed that this pre-processing can also take place in filaments. And this is important. They can alter the properties of the galaxies. Okay. But how do we know that low mass galaxies are susceptible to the environment? Because many of their properties correlate with the environment. For instance, in this work done by Galazzi et al. in 2021, they investigated 26,000 satellite galaxies within the spectral, within the redshift range of 0.01 to 0.2. They wanted to know what are the correlations between different properties of these galaxies. They beamed galaxies based on the size of their host halo. So very massive host halos are traced with pink line over here. And these are host halos more massive than 10 to the 14. These are typical for, for example, what we see in Virgo cluster. And also here we have uh, less massive host halos, 10 to the 11, 10 to the 12.5. And here in this talk, we are interested in the low mass end of this distribution over here. So this plot shows us that low mass galaxies and, uh, and on the y-axis, we have the fraction of quenched galaxies. So this plot tells us low mass galaxies in massive host halos are on average more quenched than low mass galaxies in less massive host halos. This is one of the first things that we see as a correlation. Okay, massive host halos are more effective in killing the star formation procedure in low mass galaxies. Other physical properties also show similar correlations. For example, we have here the age, and we see that low mass galaxies that are in very massive host halo are on average older than low mass galaxies that we see in less massive host halos. They are metal richer, but also there is not a huge difference as we see over here. But in any case here, the low mass galaxies in massive host halos are on average metal richer than the ones in the low mass halos. I would like to also mention this mass metallicity relation, which we are all familiar with, that metallicity also correlates with the stellar mass of the system. And also for alpha over Fe, the difference is not that much, but we see that 
within the errors. The alpha over Fe of low mass galaxies in massive host halos is higher than the low mass galaxies in low mass host halos. And also here we see also the correlation with the stellar mass. But let's focus in one cluster. What's happening inside clusters? Let's go to the coma cluster. This is the work done by Smith et al. in 2009. They investigated 100 early type dwarf galaxies in the coma cluster, and they wanted to know if this physical, these stellar population properties correlate with the distance of galaxy to the center of cluster. As we go to the central parts, the density of the intercluster medium increases. So is there a correlation over here? And they show that stellar population, uh, sorry, dwarf galaxies that are in the central parts of coma are on average older, metal poorer, and more alpha enhanced. This indicates that those that are in the central part of cluster have stopped their star formation long time ago, and they were not efficient enough in enrichment of their ISM with heavier metals. Okay, based on all these correlations that we see, there are many formation scenarios proposed for dwarf galaxies because they are one of the most abundant type of galaxies in the universe, but we don't know how do they form. There are many scenarios suggested. Two of them have gained further uh, popularity. The first one is based on the work done by Cormendi in 1985, indicating that perhaps dwarfs are remnants of low mass late type galaxies that fall into the clusters into massive galaxy groups and transformed because of the environmental effects, all that I explained thus far. And there are many observations for, uh, supporting this scenario. And there are another group of people saying that, look, we have primordial galaxies formed in the early universe, low mass, small galaxies, pressure supported, old, dominated by uh, dark matter. And in the central parts of clusters, we see similar, similar galaxies over there. So maybe at least part of present day dwarf galaxies are those primordial objects that did not go through any mergers. These are two formation scenarios, but distangling between them is not easy. We are talking about clusters and with just a snapshot of one time of cluster that we see as observers. We cannot track galaxies to see what happened to them. Um, to explain what are the difficulties for us observers to distinguish between these two formation scenarios, let's go to the Virgo cluster. The first problem we have here is the central part and the projection effects that we have. When you find a galaxy in the central part of the cluster, how sure you are, it's exactly in the center. It's in the projection, right? So it can be anywhere between you and the central part of cluster. It can be in the outer skirts. So it's not easy to distinguish between different populations in the central parts of clusters. The second problem we have is pre-processing. How are you sure that the galaxies that you see here today in the cluster have been transformed because of being in the cluster, not transformed somewhere else and accreted to the cluster? This is another thing that, that prevents us from making robust conclusion that yes, this is the formation scenario. No, that's not the formation scenario. The other problem that we have are substructures. For example, here in Virgo, you see Virgo is not a is not a dynamically is a dynamically evolving cluster. It's not relaxed, and there are some uh, high density environments over here and here. So when you do basic plots of stellar population properties, galactocentric distance, you are not taking care of these high density patches over here, and also the time, the time that you spend in the cluster as a galaxy matters. Have you been there one giga year? Have you been there five giga year? What's going on? About time, there is uh, the phase and space diagram that may help us. So we know that position of a galaxy on the phase and space diagram changes as the galaxy goes through several per-center passages and gets realized inside the cluster. Imagine you have one galaxy in point A, the beginning of accretion to the Virgo cluster. The galaxy resides here on the phase of space diagram. Then the galaxy starts from point A to go to point B, which is the first pericenter passage. And the position of galaxy on the phase of space changes from point A to point B. Then the galaxy goes through the first pericenter passage, point C, that depending on the kinetic energy of the galaxy can be inside the cluster or outside the cluster. 
This is dangerous because there are studies investigating galaxies in the field, and there is always the chance that they are back as flash galaxies. They have already figured, felt the environments for the first time. Anyhow, this position changes and goes to the point C over here. As the galaxy goes through more peri-center passages, its position, of course, changes and it becomes realized. So maybe we can track galaxies or we can assign a time to the galaxies that have been accreted to the clusters. Many studies have been focused on this. And here today, I want to present you the work done by, by, done by Pasquale et al. and Smith et al. in 2019. So, Having that idea, having that concept in mind, they went to the simulations because with simulations, we know how long a galaxy has been inside the cluster. We can track them. And they started to track satellites falling into the clusters or high density host high, uh, to massive host halos. And then they started to quantify different zones of the projected phases spectra. So if you, for example, take coma cluster as your massive cluster, you construct a projected phase space diagram, and then you start to pop, uh, take one galaxy from that cluster, you put it here. For example, it falls in zone five. According to their study and the table that they presented in their work in zone five, five, it means that your galaxy has been inside this massive cluster for about 3.4 giga years. So this is an average, at least, or on average, your galaxy has been inside the cluster for 3.4 gigahertz. This is good for observers, because then now maybe we can quantify what's happening inside the galaxies. We can quantify the environment, the exposure time. And also there are physical properties of galaxies that correlate with this average infall time. Let's go back to galaxy at all. This time they beamed their galaxies based on their accretion time. So galaxies that have been accreted to their host halo, more than 2.5 giga years, they call them ancient infallers, and they are traced with black lines. And the galaxies that have been recently accreted to the cluster, less than 2.5 giga years, as they name it, they are traced with blue lines. And they, they show that the stellar population properties correlate with the accretion time of the galaxies. So ancient infallers are on average older, metal richer and more alpha enhanced. I want you to remember this plot. Okay, still motivated by the importance of phase and space diagram. In 2018, Lisker et al. went to the Virgo cluster, selected 625 galaxies in the Virgo, put them on the project that phase and space diagram, but this time beamed the galaxies according to their absolute R band magnitude. Six bins they had. These are the bins that you can see. They are projected phase space diagram. And these are the galaxies of Virgo, color coded based on the morphology and the type of galaxies that we see there. We are now interested in the ones with orange over here. They saw that in this particular bin, 90 is have a colony on a specific part of the project that phase space diagram. What does this mean? This means that you have nine dwarf galaxies with the same distance and the same velocity inside the Virgo cluster. How can we explain this? They went to the simulations and they showed that in their study, that if you have a group of galaxies and they fall onto Virgo cluster along the observer's line of sight. So this is Virgo, this is the group, this is me observer. The group falls to the cluster. And you start to plot the projected phase and space diagram for Virgo. And I mean, by Virgo here, they had a massive host halo as massive as Virgo, not necessarily Virgo with all its special cases, its character. You see that after two or three giga years, two or three giga years, the distribution of the galaxies, satellites of that group mimics a similar similar distribution that we see in this panel over here. Based on this, they concluded that maybe these nine dwarfs are part of a galaxy group merger to Virgo taking place two to three giga years ago along the observer's line of sight. They could be a perfect candidate to investigate pre-processing in these galaxies. 
we were not sure about the accretion time. So, and this is the accretion time coming from simulation predictions, right? So we went back to the projected phase of space diagram introduced by Pasquale. We put these nine Ds on the projected phase of space diagram. So remember, these are the zones that we were talking about. They were colored in the other plot. And we saw that the galaxies, the nine galaxies are these squares over here, right? We saw that they have similar accretion time of two to three giga years ago as predicted by the simulations shown in this guy at all. And also, let's forget about the two to three giga years. Let's think about it that you have a sample of galaxies came to Virgo at the same time. So we can see how Virgo is affecting them. If Virgo is affecting them, it should affect them similarly because they have been under this environmental effect for the same time and they have similar stellar masses range between 10 to the 8.9 uh, to 10 to the 9.2 or 3. So very similar in terms of stellar mass, very similar in terms of accretion time. Do, they, do we see this colony in the spatial distribution of galaxies in Virgo? No. These nine galaxies are here, these <coughs> squares. And there is, a there is an explanation to that. So me as an observer, this is Virgo and this is the galaxy coming to Virgo. They are going to Virgo like this. So an observer would see them dispersed around the center of Virgo. How do they look like? These are these nine galaxies on the top here. Okay, we observed these nine galaxies with MUSE. We did the data reduction. We first investigated their kinematics. The kinematic results are published in 2020. And unfortunately today, I don't have much time to go through that. So today I will just show you the stellar population properties of these nine galaxies. And we decided to measure their stellar populations using leak indices. This is one of the most common type of measuring age, metallicity, and alpha over Fe in galaxies. Uh, these are indexes that are defined. As you can see here, the indexes, and this is the reference where they are defined. And they are sensitive to age or metallicity of the galaxies, meaning that the strength of the index changes as the metallicity level or the age of the galaxy change. So here we can have an estimate of age and metallicity and alpha over Fe inside the galaxies. We wanted to compare our results with a significant, not significant, with a statistically meaningful sample of dwarfs in Coma and Virgo. But not many studies, there are not many studies uh, about IFU data of dwarf galaxies inside the clusters. So we would end up with comparing nine galaxies with other nine galaxies, which is not really meaningful. So, but there are a lot of studies over longer slits or one spectrum per galaxy. So what we did here, we created an average MUSE spectrum per galaxy. What is that? In the MUSE, uh, MUSE IFU, MUSE field of view, we discarded the spectrums with signal to noise less than three because we don't trust them. And then within one effective radius of galaxy, we stacked all the spectrums there. So we created one average news spectrum per galaxy. This is something that I'm showing here for one of the galaxies. So super high signal to noise we're gonna have at the end. And then we started to measure leaking indices over them. On the IFU data, we did also another result that, uh, another work that I will show you some of the results later. So we measured the leak indices, and then you also have to measure the leak indices of a stellar population models for which you know the information. SSP models, single stellar population models. We use Vazdekin SSP models based on Miles Stellar Library. Here you can see the characteristics of the library that we used. And the idea is that you measure the leak indices over SSP models for which you know the age, you know the metallicity, and you know the alpha over FD, right? So you can create grids. Here we have H beta zero versus MG over FE. And here at each point is one SSP model for which we measure the leak indices. They, they, will they will make this grid for you. In this grid, as you can see, for example, here shown for age, from top to bottom, the age changes. So this grid here, these points here are for, model, uh, for models with the age around two to three giga years. And these models here are for the ages around 10, 11 giga years. And I want you to note this, this degeneracy that we have here. I will talk about it later. And then you have this grid, you measure the same parameters for your galaxy, and then you start to compare 
based on the closest distance of your measurements and the SSP model, you can estimate the age and metallicity of the galaxy. So at the end, you have these two grids for which I'm not showing all the SSP models. It would be super crowded. You wouldn't see anything. This is just to show you how things fall there. So the uh, colored points are the dwarf galaxies that we have, these nine DEs, and the gray lines are the SSP models. From left to right, the metallicity increases, and from top to bottom, the age increases. And then you can see that, for example, this galaxy is very close to the model with minus 0.25. We can have an estimate of the metallicity, but it's not as that naive as I'm showing you here. I will explain what's happened next. So this grid tells you the metallicity and age, and this grid gives you information about alpha over F e, because you have two models, two sets of models, one with alpha around zero and one with alpha around 0.4x. But the space between these in the previous plot, for example, here, the space between the models of minus 0.35 and minus 0.96 is huge. So this will be a lot of uncertainty here. Also, your SSP models that we were working on, Milas, has only three sets of value of alpha over FE, 0, 0 0.2, 0 0.4. But nature is not working like that. You know, we can have different alpha over FE. So how can we overcome this limitation? We interpolated our models in this grid based on the age and metallicity. So we decreased the space between the points that I showed you so that we can have this continuous model as you see here. And of course here, the degeneracy is like folded, right? So the degeneracy in the old ages is evident. It means that if a point, if a galaxy falls here, you cannot be sure saying that this galaxy is eight gigahertz or 14 gigahertz or 12 gigahertz. This is the degeneracy people are talking about when they want to measure or fit all the stellar population models. And here for alpha over FE, we not only interpolated, but also extrapolated the models. So the final alpha over FE range that we are measuring is between 0.8 and minus 0.3. And then we ran fitting. This is a four-step fitting procedure based on chi to minimization approach for which I have explained it perfect, uh, like extensively, oh, perfectly, extensively in the paper that is published. But also if you're interested, we can go through it after the talk. Today, we don't have time for the much technicality. Let's jump to the results then. Okay. Three histograms over here shows you age, metallicity, and alpha over Fe for the nine galaxies shown in red histograms for dwarf galaxies in Virgo DEs. They are all similar type of dwarf galaxies, early type dwarfs. Uh, Virgo traced by pink histogram and DEs in the, Virgo, in the coma cluster with gray histograms. I want you to remember from this point until end of the talk that all the galaxies that we compare have similar stellar mass range as our own galaxies. Why? As you saw in the beginning, metallicity and alpha over Fe depends on the stellar mass of the galaxy. And we wanted to watch that effect. We wanted to see if there is an if we wanted to see if there is a difference, that difference is purely because of environment or not. So this is a comparison sample with a similar stellar mass range as our own sample, but different exposure times to the Virgo or Coma cluster. Okay. In terms of age, we don't see much difference between our nine Ds, Ds in Virgo, Ds in Coma. Yet one thing should capture your attention that nine Ds with similar exposure to the Virgo cluster, why they have different ages, why some of them are young as two gigahertz, why some of them are 10 gigahertz old. I will answer that. Then let's go to the metallicity. Our, our sample is not that much different than Virgo cluster, but Together with Virgo, they are systematically metal poorer than the coma cluster. Why is that so? This is my question as well. If you have an answer, I'm happy to, to listen to the answer. This can be due to the different characteristics of coma and Virgo cluster. Coma is more virilized. Virgo, as I showed you, is not, uh, it's a dynamically young uh, galaxy cluster. And also it can be due to the limit, uh, lower number of Virgo DEs that investigate that we have included in this plot compared to the coma. It was not intentional. There is not much information available in the literature. And alpha over FE. Our 90 is all of them. 
are more alpha enhanced than Virgo D is and Coma D is. And these are at the same stellar mass range. So it cannot be the effect of stellar mass. What's going on? One thing that we wanted to check is the expo exposure time, infall time. So we went back to the phase and space diagram plotted, uh, introduced by Pasquale et al. You remember the color diagram that it was there? We reduced the zones here. So we have only three zones, zone one, zone two, and zone three. Zone one are for gal are galaxies that have been exposed to the environment less than three giga years, recent in colors. Zone two are between three to five giga years, and zone three are more than five giga years, ancient in colors. And then we put Coma, Virgo, and these nine galaxies there. If you remember the phase and space, they were occupying the similar location that I showed you first. Uh, we mark these nine galaxies of interest with a green box over here. And as you can see, in terms of age, for galaxies of same stellar mass range and same accretion time to the cluster, we don't see much difference. Our sample have this scatter in the age, but also other galaxies in the same zone have this scatter. In terms of metallicity, we see that our sample are metal poorer than the other galaxies of zone two, and this difference is two to three sigma. The numbers are reported in the paper. In terms of alpha over FE, in the same zone of accretion, similar accretion time, galaxies of similar stellar mass, our sample are on, uh, are on average metal rich, uh, alpha enhanced, sorry, alpha enhanced than the other galaxies. And the difference is eight sigma. Quickly compare with what I showed you in the beginning of the talk. If you remember Smith at all, this plot for MGFE over the distance to the center of cluster, we saw that dwarf galaxies can have this high alpha over FE, but in the center of the coma. These galaxies are in the outer skirts of Virgo. So what's going on? If you remember the Galaxy et al. paper, based on uh, this was the um, galaxies that they quantified based on their accretion type. They show that recent infallers should have lower alpha over FE compared to ancient infallers. But in our case, it's different. It's exactly vice versa. So again, what's going on? Because alpha over FE traces the duration of star formation in galaxies, we decided to also derive the star formation histories of these nine leaves. For that, we went back to that average muse spectrum. And this time we, feed, we did the full spectrum fitting using a starlight, similar stellar library. We don't want it to add more systematic problems here. Uh, but this time, because the library I showed you had only three alpha over it, but we see that in this case, we have different numbers. So we wanted to be as precise as we can. This time we interpolated SSP models, the flux of the SSP models first based on the alpha that we measure for the galaxies. So we tried to reduce the uncertainties that different alpha values could introduce to the fit. Again, we can talk about it after the talk extensively. So we did the full spectrum fitting, and then as the result, you have, what, what full spectrum fitting does is that you give it the SSP models, it tries to add them together so that it can create the best spectrum that fits best the observed light, right? And when it finds it, it gives you the recipe. I put 2% of this SSP model with age 8 giga years, whatever. I put 60% of SSP model. This gives you the recipe, right? And with that recipe, you can construct the profiles or star formation history of the galaxy. What we did is that we took that recipe on the y-axis, are the light fractions, and on the x-axis are the ages of SSP models that we have. So here we can say we can see that okay, let's go with the here is less case. Let's go with the light blue profile, right? So here we can see that what fraction of the total observed light comes from the SSP of age 10 gigahertz? What fraction comes from SSP of age 6 gigahertz? And with this, we try to understand what happened in the past of this galaxy. These are the profiles that we have. So the two dashed lines here are two estimates of the average infall time of these galaxies to Virgo, one coming from simulations, one coming from projected phase and space diagram, two to three giga years ago. We saw that six DEs show recent peak of a star formation at the time of accretion or after the accretion onto the cluster, and three DEs came to the cluster already quenched. 
no signs of star formation. By definition, this is pre processing. But let's dig more into it. And also here we have on the top the light fractions, and here we have the mass fractions. Okay. Remember, all these 90s had high alpha over Fe. So let's see. Let's start with the ones that had this recent peak of the star formation. What's going on over here? Um, in their study, uh, Volmer et al. in 2001, they discussed that how would the cluster environment affect the star formation activity of recent infallers. So if you have a galaxy that still has some gas reservoir, comes to the cluster, in the beginning of the accretion to the cluster, it feels a shock, the run pressure. The run pressure can compress the gas in the inner disk of the galaxy, where the surface density of gas can increase by a factor of 1.52, as reported by Wolmer et al. And this can initiate a new phase of a star formation or, pre to, or enhance the pre-existing one. And we believe this is what's going on for this six galaxies. They had the star formation, as you can see. They had some gas reservoir. They came to the cluster. And this is how ramp pressure acts on them and forced them to form new stars and then left them gas deficient because we could not detect nebular emission lines in these nine years. The maps that this is the work that I'm currently doing, it's almost finished, ready for almost ready for submission. We went to the IFU data, we constructed the stellar population maps, age, metallicity, and alpha over FE. And we saw that for these six DEs, in the center, we have this younger stellar population, which is metal richer and less alpha enhanced. This is the plot, uh, this is the map of VCC 170. And in the central part, you can see that it's dominated by very young stellar population. So this is the explanation that we have. But still, this doesn't explain why they have high alpha over FE. We believe that because the age, metallicity, and alpha over FE I was reporting to you are light-weighted values. So they are overweighted by the recent phase of star formation in the galaxies. And we believe that we see high alpha over FE because of this recent and very short phase of star formation that has happened inside these galaxies. But also, these galaxies had this continuous star formation history before coming to the cluster. So why they still have this high alpha over Fe? We believe that because maybe efficiency of star formation in the past of these galaxies was not enough to really metal enrich their ISM. It can be due to the environment, an environment that is hostile to star formation, the galaxy that Lisker et al. suggested. The other three dwarfs, explanation of this is rather easy. They had this peak of star formation long time ago, happened in a short time, remember, that these are, this is the range that we have degeneracy in the models, right? We know that they have formed these stars long time ago. This has happened, this has taken place on a shortest, short time scale. And this can explain the high alpha over Fe. The shorter your time, the shorter your star formation is, the higher your alpha over Fe is in a galaxy. And these galaxies came to the cluster without any gas reservoir. So how could we go affect them? There is no gas left, right? So that's how nothing had happened to these galaxies. And that's why we see alpha, high alpha over Fe in these 3Ds. And in fact, the alpha over Fe we see in these 3Ds are higher than the other 60s that we see. And both, all of them are higher than zero dex, which is for, for low mass galaxies as suggested by other studies. Okay, um, the last two minutes, I've tried to wrap it up and give you the in interpretation that we think is valid for this case. Um, one thing is that uh, these nine galaxies, same as stellar mass range, came to the cluster Virgo at the same time. I don't see any reason why would Virgo act collectively different on these galaxies, quench one of them, let gas in some one of them, let one of them still forming the stars. I don't understand. Similar exposure to the Virgo. And also I don't understand why would Virgo act differently on these nine galaxies and let the other dwarf galaxies that came to the cluster at the same time act differently. So we believe that what we see here is not because of the Virgo cluster. It's because of the environment before the Virgo cluster. Let's assume it was the galaxy group. 
Then you may ask me then still why they are different. They were inside a similar environment before coming to the Virgo. And I would like to address that question again with the exposure time. 3D is had longer exposure, not to Virgo, to the previous galaxy group. That's why they lost all of their gas. That's why their star formation stopped long ago. That's why they have high alpha over FE. That's why they are pressure supported. And then we have 60s that they had shorter exposure to the group. Group was not still didn't have enough time to take away the gas, to affect the kinematics, to affect the star formation. But still, they couldn't form very good, they couldn't have very you know, efficient star formation to really dilute their, to really enrich their ISM with the more heavier metals. And then all of them, all of them together, these nine galaxies came to the Virgo. Virgo started the phase, the first phase of act, ramp pressure, started to act. 3Ds didn't have gas, so Virgo cannot do anything. The six others had some gas leftovers. So that's how the Virgo started its action and, in, had, and, and uh, enhanced the pre-existing star formation activity or initiated a new phase of star formation. And that's why we see these different things, high alpha over FE, different star formation histories and et cetera. So this is our interpretation, but if you have other interpretation, I would be more than happy to listen to that. We can discuss. And I would like to leave you with the conclusions Emphasizing again on the fall time exposure to the environment if you are interested in evolution of galaxies under the environmental effects, time, exposure time is something that you cannot neglect. And today we have some tools that we can measure that. So let's also include them in our analysis. And also I would like to emphasize on alpha over FE, chemical enrichment in galaxies. This is linked with the star formation activity of galaxies. So it's very precise not precious, precious uh, value, precious parameter that we, I think we should invest more time in analyzing that. Um, thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much. So now the talk is open for questions. Here in the room, Rosa. Um, Okay, thank you very much for your talk. It was it is very interesting the one that you have done. Um, you have explained in the facility in the, in the talk. So I I guess uh, I was not the sometimes the your argument. Um, I wonder if you have studied because maybe you can explain something more about how to how to use the alpha. Alpha enhancement model mm -hmm. with the starlight uh, city. Yes. Um, and also, if you have studied the possible the generals between the metallicity and the H and the alpha. The For the full spectrum fitting. Yes. Okay, yes. Uh, regarding the first part of your question, what we did is that the SSP models had three alpha over FE values 0, 0 0.2, and 0 0.4. But for one galaxy, we measured, for example, 0 0.335 plus 0 0.36 or minus 0 0.34. These are just numbers I'm just now giving, right? And then we took those three alpha values, three, we can okay, we took those three alpha values, for example, 0 0.36. And then we interpolated the flux of SSP models because you know the flux for 0.4. You know the flux of 0.2 and you know the flux of 0.0. So you can interpolate for the flux of 0.36. And we, construct, we created SSP models of that particular alpha, alpha 0.36, and we used that in doing the full spectrum fitting, but within the range also the range of errors. Regarding the second part, if we check for the mass metallicity degeneracy, yes, we checked that it's actually presented in the paper. So we can we compared because mass metallicity degeneracy, we have better control over it when we do the leak indices fitting. We can see where the galaxy is there. We can check the surrounding uh, models that are there in terms of range of age and metallicity. But with full spectrum fitting, we cannot do that. It's somehow like a black box that it goes inside and comes out. But we, uh, we compared. We compared the results that we get from full spectrum fitting and from the leak indices. And we saw that there is not very, very 
uh, weird numbers or very weird ages. What a starlight measured for age and metallicity for these galaxies is similar to what leak indices also measure for these galaxies. This is what we did, but uh, maybe there are better tests for that I'm not aware of. And uh, also, I have the impression because you are coming also that the, in some way that you are um, uh, collapsing or putting together mean the spectrum. Yes. So, um, and also, um, I mean, they had uh, some effect in the in the global result because you are missing part of, of the galaxy where you are expecting a gradient of the ages of the metallicity. Yes. True. And so, how, how do you deal with this? So this work actually went along with the analyzers over the IFU data constructing the maps. So the numbers that we get from the stacked spectrum and the range that we got was very consistent with what we get from the age maps. We don't have a large gradient in ages in these nine galaxies, I can tell you that because I have seen the maps. So we know that the age number that we report here are not, are not that much different or affected. For metallicity, we, we saw that there is a gradient in the central part. We have metal richer stellar population, but also the variation is not that much high. And for alpha over Fe, we actually see this high alpha enhancement in all parts of the galaxy. In center, it reaches to 0 0.3, 0 0.25. In the outer skirts, it's like 0 0.5, 0 0.55. So the values that we report here are really consistent with the variation of the age metallicity and alpha over the values that we see in the maps. For that, I can assure you that they, not, they did not really affect the final global results we presented here. And the, the final comment, uh, I would like to know what do, do you expect to find for the formation of your galaxy if you work in the in both? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> I mean, I can only speculate that because not, not, not many studies have been worked on dwarf galaxies in voids, but uh, because there are a very low number of uh, quays and dwarf galaxies in voids, I would expect to see continuous star formation activity and uh, lower levels of alpha enrichment in these galaxies because they are still forming the stars, they are dominated by the gas, and they had this continuous star formation activity. But for sure, there are already surprises maybe like there. So I'm, I'm open, maybe in the next two years that I'm going to work on voids in the, dwarfs in the void, I would get surprised, I would be surprised. I don't know. Um, I think you put very, uh, this very nice and detailed talk. Um, okay. I was just wondering, you just present us uh, like two different groups of the DDs, uh, the six uh, DDs, which has not been so long, if they say this previous group and the other three. Mm -hmm. And then we're modeling also the spectral time to reproduce the star populations. I was considering, um, I would just explore the possibility of these pre-processing processes changing um, somehow the also the IMF uh, for these galaxies as you know there are many processes most of them acting in the outer parts of the galaxy when then we have reservoirs of gas in the inner part and then maybe exploring also a different IMF how these results are so consistent with let's say deviations from this standard behavior which yeah. is also a question for itself the dwarf galaxies yeah that's actually a very good question and it's actually one of the things that I'm currently working on I am driving IMF of these galaxies on different parts of the galaxy and also comparing it with other dwarfs. In this work, in terms of alpha over Fe, I mean, we know that alpha over Fe depends on the IMF, but in this work, we did not consider that uh, because it would, first of all, add so much discrepancy and you know, it would be super, super uh, complicated because also not many people worked on IMF of dwarf galaxies. But this is actually that maybe I can have an answer to that in two years. I was looking forward to that. Thank you. Yeah, um, very impressive. So uh, uh, for this, a very complicated um, uh, subject, and you, it heavily relies on models because there, there is lack of observation, mm -hmm. especially during uh, such a long time scale. So my question is, um, what do you think the um, the similarity is between the um, different galaxies in terms of kinematics? Mm -hmm. 
in gas content to begin with. Uh, to, uh, to, to begin with. Of course, they belong to one group, one similar group, but they may have different internal structures, mm -hmm. sure. different internal kinematics, and different internal uh, gas content. So, so I, yeah, would that be something that would affect a lot the um, the final or the present day um, structure within the vertical galaxy uh, cluster, and also with the region where they like, because in Pedro you have, um, in the cluster you have different um, um, content or hot gas in different regions of the cluster. So would it be that, um, would they be located in different regions where the gas, um, the hot gas is, has different um, content, mm -hmm. intensity? So I start with the second part of the question. Yeah. What you want is, it's actually a little bit more than super complicated. <laughs> it's too complicated, you know? You have to have a very precise map of the gas inside the cluster in terms of temperature, density, etc. And then you have to put the galaxies on top of that, but still you are suffering from projection. Yeah. yeah, and the phasor space is not sensitive to the substructures inside the clusters. It just gives you an estimate of the time. But in during this time, the galaxy was where in the cluster? It's another question that maybe simulation people can tell us about it. Okay. And the second, first part of your question, if I understand it correctly, was that the initial, the, the, the first moment that the galaxy goes to the high density environment, how does that galaxy look like affect how we see it today? It was it, the, did I get it correctly? Exactly. Because one of the, um, one thing that is clear from simulation, especially mm -hmm. regarding um, um, the um, ramp pressure, for example, in galaxies, that the orbit of the galaxy is very important. Yes, exactly. With respect to the cluster. Yes. One also thing that is important is the internal kinematics of the galaxy. Exactly. Especially the angular moment of the Yes. Orbit. And these are very fundamental parameters in galaxy evolution. Yes. And so they may affect how the Cluster is affecting the um, the uh, you know the structure of the galaxy itself. Yeah, that's absolutely so, true. It's an open question. I, I'm, like I said, it's very complicated, so you need more than to really understand. I but, mean, yeah. what you are saying is absolutely true. The initial condition of the galaxy matters. The inclination it falls into the cluster matters. The orbit matters. The state of the galaxy itself in terms of kinematics, dark matter halo. These on these matters. One way that you can overcome this is by increasing the number of galaxies that you observe, but not the one that we have. IFU observations are needed because you need to do the kinematics of the galaxies. You need to estimate the dark matter. You need to understand the gas component and where this gas component is resided. You know? So yes, it's a complicated thing. It requires more than one PhD to answer that, but I think we are on that way. So I think in five or six years, we can sit together and say, oh, we found it. Or we know, we can quantify this, you know? Fingers crossed. <laughs> yes, fingers crossed. More questions in the room. Some participants also can make questions. So please raise your hand if you, are, if you want to do a question. Yeah, One final question. So Preprocessing in groups versus uh, clusters. <laughs> Debate. Which one is more important? I mean, is it more important in groups or in inside the cluster? Um, I would say not in groups and not in clusters, in filaments. In filaments. Yes. I would say filaments are more important because most of the galaxies that we have reside in filaments. And there are studies showing that preprocessing already is on act in filaments. So I think if you want to know what happened to the cluster, we should go through the majority of galaxies in the cluster. And I think filaments are the place to start. Yeah. Questions? No questions? No questions from Zoom. We have a comment on YouTube, Raul Dominguez. Nice talk, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, seeing no more questions, we can close the talk here. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.